Do you think governments will still have a role to play in money and currency in the future, or oh, should their role be removed from it? Well, in, I in think order to, in order to distinguish between yeah. you know politics and money, sure. because I always contend they don't mix, yeah. just like oil and water right. don't mix. Well, I mean that's the fundamental problem, right? That governments aren't held held financially accountable for their decisions because they're there for a short time period, and you know while I'm in power, we're in a party. And I'll leave the problem for someone else. And of course, the someone else comes in, he realizes the dimension of the party, but uh, the problem, but he still wants to party. Mm -hmm. And you know, they try all these programs to try to keep things together. But all the while, and I think everybody knows it, the fiscal uh, and deficit situation that there is deteriorating. So. Yeah, I, I did a King World News interview uh, not too long ago, and we were talking about kicking the can down the road, and I said, it's no longer a can, it's a two-ton boulder. <laughs> and, you know, people are finally starting to recognize, you know, that we've, we're pretty close yeah. to, you know, the, 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 the point where reality has to come back into right. play. We're, we're, we're at that point. I mean, I can't say when it's going to be, who knows when it's going to be, but you can sort of sense as you, you feel even in particularly Europe now, how you know every day there's something new that happens, and you know the bond markets don't look like they're cooperating with the uh, ESF uh, involvement. They just don't look like they're cooperating. Yeah. So, and the bond market, of course, will be the tip off to um, to a, a fundamental problem because it's so much bigger than the stock market, and governments need the bond market. And the fact that was it the ESFS that uh, two days ago tried to issue three billion of bonds. <laughs> They pulled the bond offering. Well, where does three billion get you? Yeah, and, and they're if you supposed can't to raise three billion. How are they going to raise a trillion that they say <laughs> exactly. they need? Uh, it's yeah. really sort of silly. I mean, you had a very scary chart uh, in your presentation this morning: CDS um, uh, rates yeah. on the uh, European on bond. the sovereign debt. Yeah, which what? basically it's worse now than it was back in yeah. 2008. Back in 08, it wasn't a sovereign problem. For sure it's a sovereign problem now, because the sovereigns took on the problems of the banking business. So they've made a bad decision, they've gone down the wrong road, and they seem yeah. to be sticking to this bad decision, yeah. rather than recognizing like a yeah. businessman would, hey, we made a bad decision, we have to cut our losses and yeah. go back in the right direction, but yeah. they seem to be heading in the wrong direction, which is more money printing, qualitative easing, yeah. quantitative easing. But you know, even a businessman, I suspect when a businessman knows he's bankrupt, he doesn't declare bankruptcy. Somebody forces them into bankruptcy. That's a good point. Somebody calls the loan, right? <clears throat> I don't think any government is going to declare a bankruptcy. Uh, someone's going to call the loan somewhere along the line. In other words, you're not going to buy the bonds. Mm -hmm. And when they don't buy the bonds, it's over because your creditor won't give you credit. Well, the fact that they didn't buy the ES, EFSF bonds, yeah. maybe that's sort of the well, beginning of the tip of the iceberg. It's a bit of a statement. Uh, that's why you know we have to be concerned about that. That it's fine to promise things, but if if really nobody wants to buy the credit, how do you provide the money? Yeah. So, you know, today we hear about the IMF is going to create 250 billion of SDRs. Now, I'm not a great student of SDRs. I'm not even sure what an SDR is, and I don't know how you create it. Maybe you just write something on a piece of paper saying we're created 250 billion of SDRs and we all go party some more. Um, but that's where they're just writing it with their own pen. If they ask someone else to write them the check, they you know they can't get the check. <laughs> yeah, you know I often say that a uh, hundred years from now people will look back at this era the same way we look back at the Mississippi bubble and the South mm -hmm. Sea bubble, and you know ask how could people have been so gullible right. and you know clearly misunderstood exactly what was going on, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I guess what we have to really do as individuals is just step back from everything you see sure. on TV and read in the papers and think it through from a logical common sense point of view. Mm -hmm. You know, balance sheets, cash flow at the right. end of the day, that's what really counts. Yeah. I even uh, look at the uh, zero interest rate policy and I always say, you know, 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, what did we think we we're doing? We're not paying the savers any money to save? Mm -hmm. Like it's ridiculous. I don't know where these theories came from. And you know, if you asked anybody to look back at their Economics 101 book, there was never a in zero interest rate policy. There was never quantitative easing. There was never TARP, TELF, conservatorships. I never knew what a conservatorship was before. Now we have some of the biggest ones in the world. Well, you're raising a good point because I think a lot of people don't even understand what capital is, uh, or what capitalism for that matter. Because what we're talking about today is people saying it's a crisis of capitalism, but reality is it's a crisis of socialism. And you know, I keep yeah. going back to one of my favorite quotes from Margaret Thatcher. She said, the problem with socialism is you eventually run out of other people's money. Right. 
And that's, right. Isn't that it described exactly. clearly what you know, governments are, are doing yeah. today? They've, they, they've taxed as much as they can. Yeah. Uh, they, they're continuing to tax with the risk of destroying the economy. If they right. destroy the economy, where are they going to get the money to fulfill right. their promises? So a lot of promises are going to be broken. Yeah. And just think of, you know, the banking sector is a big sector and they're all trying to deleverage. You know, are they going to be buying more government bonds? You know, they might be locked out of them, but they want to shrink their balance sheets. Well, the easiest thing, of course, to sell is the government bond because there's a bid from the central banks right now. Yeah. But when it comes time to reload, who's going to be the buyer? Yeah, the ECB has expended its balance sheet a trillion euros over the past couple of years. Right. Uh, and most of that is just, you know, government bonds and, right. you know, other types of quantitative easing programs. Sure. So, I mean, we, I think we've got some serious issues to deal with in terms of currency and in that environment. I guess the message for the viewers of this video is continue to stay the course, continue to accumulate gold yeah. and silver. When, I mean, one thing I would certainly say to people, and I mean, I don't mind saying that I'm a, I own personally 80%, at least 80% of my money in precious metals, even the money I run on what I believe to be a very prudent basis, I have 80% of that in precious metals. And it doesn't bother me because I see all the things that are going on around me and I just you know, it pains me that others have not participated in this 11-year bull market where gold has outperformed almost every currency by five or six hundred percent. It's outperformed, the stocks have outperformed the market, stock market by fourteen hundred percent. And there's this great wealth redistribution going on where you have to be in precious metals. And, you know, when I said, I don't mean one or two percent of your portfolio in precious metals. I mean, do I have problems saying that I think people should have a majority of their portfolio in precious metals? No, I don't. That's what I do. Mm. So it seems very logical to me. Yeah, I always make the case the older you are, the more precious metals you want because you want to be conservative. And a lot of people will question, well, how can yeah, you be conservative? Course, yeah. But that yeah. really is the conservative strategy. Yeah. So the older yeah. you are, the higher percentage you yeah. should have. Um, people regard it as risky, and, and being in precious metals. Well, I don't regard it that way. I think it's the wise thing to do. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Well, Eric, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with Eric Sprott, the founder and chairman of Sprott Asset Management in Toronto, Canada. Thank you, Eric. Okay, James, my honor to be here. Thanks.